uh, th thank you very much, uh, Chief Becker, for inviting me. Um, and I've considered an honor to address uh, the men and women of the Chicago Police Department as well as the members of the community that are here. Um, there is a link between Memorial Day and policing, um, and it's a very strong link. Many of these officers now current, either currently serve or have served in the military, and we kind of honor the loss of an officer the same way we would honor the loss of a soldier. Uh, both of them sacrifice their lives to protect others, and although the mission is quite different, the code, the honor, the tradition, and the pride are very similar, they're the same. So there is kind of a link here why we honor police officers in the same month and around the same time that we honor our soldiers for the same type of service they provide. Policing itself is a forward-looking profession, but there's a lot of ties to the past. There's a lot of tradition in policing. It's a very traditional institution. Every officer that has given their life in the line of duty, as you can witness here, many years, I was so surprised to see how many years ago these officers lost their lives, but they're still being honored today in 2015. Those people are brought with them on every call that every officer goes on, every day they come to work, they carry these people with them and the people behind. So it's not, not surprising that police departments are very similar to extended families um, in the way they act, the way they carry themselves, the way they approach each other. Um, and many times these officers will spend more time with their chosen family here at the police department than they do with their actual family at home. Um, and they do this, and the families share this burden of the profession. So when we, when we honor the people on the back wall there and the people here behind us, you're not just honoring the officer, you're honoring the department they came from, their chosen family, as well as the family that supports them and sends them out every day and shares the burden of having a police officer in the family. They also make countless sacrifices to make sure that on every ship, that officer comes home. So in reality, in every single way, if you think about a police department, they are a family. It's a family of officers and a family of people. And the bonds between these officers are strong because they have to be, as Chief Becker, Becker touched on. Policing is an inherently dangerous profession. The problem is there's many lulls between those dangers. So this is, this is not a constant danger, uh, which is probably the worst part of this job. Um, and the fact that police officers' lives can change in an instant, but so can the lives of the people they come in contact with. So this is a reciprocal relationship. Um, and with that comes great power, great authority, and responsibility, because often these decisions made, uh, some inconsequential but some consequential, are made within a fraction of a second. And I think Chief Becker was touching on this when the fact that you don't want people delaying their actions with fear of what might happen if they act, because chances are what will happen if they don't act is worse for them in the department than it is for the actual events that take place. Um, these individuals, they go out every day and respond to this every call in every place. They can't say no. They often go to places that none of us would like to go and they deal with people that we are purposely not dealing with and we ask them to come in and intervene. These decisions impact individuals, they impact families, departments, communities, cities, states, and as we've seen recently over this past year, even the nation is affected by what people do in a split second. So it must be recognized that this is nearly an impossible job to do to balance the competing demands of enforcing law, upholding people's rights, and providing quality services. So you're actually asked to do not only just a dangerous job, but what I consider to be an impossible job. Um, and it's a free and open democracy. We're allowed to talk back. We're allowed to refuse. We're allowed to state our opinions. Trust me when I say it is much easier to police in places that are not free and open and democratic. Uh, this, this creates a whole new wrinkle on American policing. It's equally difficult to ask human beings to face danger and life-ending situations while treating all people fairly and equally on the next call as if the last call did not happen. This is a human endeavor and ultimately human nature is tough. Thus, the public is always going to be disappointed with police. This is a reality of the job. We're always gonna be disappointed because we fail to recognize how impossible the job is. So it might be helpful to be reminded of why police exist in the first place and why they're never going to get along with us in the way we would like them to. Um, paid police officers have only existed for 186 years out of thousands of years of human existence. And they exist because we have to have them in order to run a modern industrialized economy. When we worked on the farm and we stayed at home and we could protect our families and our property, but we no longer do that. You're only here today leaving your property unabated, leaving your home where it is because police officers are there to respond if somebody breaks into it. 
So we cannot have the kind of economy and the kind of nation we have if we don't have people that are paid to do this job and to look after our families and our property and ourselves. We wouldn't have money in our pocket to go spend in local businesses if we didn't know that people couldn't take it from us because there's somebody we could call to intervene in that situation. So in a sense, police are kind of the lifeblood of our entire economy, even though we don't often think about it that way. We see them in many ways as something we try to avoid, um, but when the time comes, we call them because we know that we need them. So essentially, we ask these people to go into any type of situation, anytime, anywhere, they can't say no, and they must deal with that situation. We can leave, we can go, somebody's, somebody's waving a gun, I'm running, but I call somebody who then has to come in and deal with that individual. They don't have the option of leaving. And we often don't think about that. We say, why didn't they do this? Why didn't they do that? And it's easy to do that a week later, a month later, it's easy to look at a video after it's released and say, I don't understand why they didn't do that. But that only is afforded the luxury of being able to look at it in hindsight and detach from actually being in that situation. So a lot of times we judge unfairly a split second decision afterwards looking back with time and the luxury of being able to do that. In addition, they see people at the worst points of their life. They see people that have been brutalized, that have been raped, that have been shot, that have been stolen from. They also see, as I, I guess I, I would like to steal that wolf analogy for the, for the future, but they do see that other that other wolf. They see that a lot. And the people they're dealing with are not very predictable all the time. You know, it, it doesn't always come with the face of I'm going to do something to you. A lot of times you get complacent because people come with this notion of, okay, I'm, I'm abiding by what you say, I'm obeying you, and then in a split second that can change. And many times they're out in places, it's dark, it's late at night, they're in places where they're outnumbered, they're outmanned, and we're asking them to do a job that's impossible to do. And we often don't think about this when we judge the police in hindsight. Recall that on 9-11, there were no arrests to be made and no laws to be enforced, yet 72 men and women of the New York Police Department ran into those buildings as everyone else was trying to leave. They were not doing the job of policing. They were doing the job of public safety, and they paid with their lives. Anybody that's been to the Chicago Police Department, before you even get to the information desk, you see every single badge of every single officer that's ever lost their life. And that is a long hallway. There's been a lot of people that have given their lives and what they do every day, they sacrifice their lives to protect citizens they have never even met and have no relation to them. Think about the, the kind of selfless act that that entails. So after many years of proudly working with the East Chicago Police Department, and I do proudly work with the men and women of the East Chicago Police Department, these officers represent the very core of policing that was laid out in 1829 by Sir Robert Peel. The nine principles, I'm only gonna to touch on a few, but the basic mission for which the police exist is to prevent crime and disorder. It's not to arrest, it's not to enforce laws. It's there so that we can go about our lives, we can go about our business, we can go about our commerce, our educations. We can be here today knowing that if somebody breaks into the house that you left alone today, somebody else will respond to it and will make sure that your property is secure. The ability to perform police duties is dependent upon public approval of police actions. This is often where we fall short on the public side as well as the police side. There's equal blame here in why the relationship between the police and the community is not as equal as it should be. We judge a lot and we don't listen. Police must be willing to secure the willing cooperation of the public in voluntary observation of the law and be able to secure and maintain the respect of the public. I would say that in general the public is overwhelmingly respectful of police. Judging by these dates on the banners, it's great to see that it's been that long since East Chicago lost a police officer in a city that does have a lot of gun activity historically. The degree of cooperation of the public that can be secured diminishes proportionately to the necessity of the physical use of force. Police are the only people in open society that are allowed to use force on us. People in jails are allowed to use it, mental institutions, but in public, open, free society, they're the only ones allowed to use force on us. So it must be willing to cooperate and voluntarily obey the law and listen to police officers uh, because they are approaching the job from a different perspective than we are during that traffic stop. You know, many people don't know what it's like to pull over a car. It's dark at night, the street is lonely. You don't know who is in that car. You might be pulling them over for a tag being out. That person might be wanted for murder in another state. And we often don't think about the, the inherent dangers. We know about it, we watch television, we kind of, we, we have a vague idea. But until you're actually in those shoes and making that stop and walking up to that car at night and the person's not responding, um, it does help to kind of withhold judgment on what you believe ought to be done and realize what, what people are actually doing when they're, when they're doing this job. 
And this is important. Police seek and preserve public favor, not by catering to public opinion, but by constantly demonstrating absolute and partial service to the law. Police at all times should maintain a relationship with the public that gives reality to the historic tradition that the police are the public and the public are the police. And the police being only members of the public who are paid to give full-time attention to duties that are incumbent on every citizen in the interest of the community's welfare and existence. I propose to you that of all the principles, that is probably the one that is the most true and the most inherent. And as I go through this list and, and prepare this speech, I realize working several years now with the East Chicago Police Department, its administration, its officers, the city, that this department does represent the concept of what Peel talked about in 1829 about what a police department should be. The department is changing in many positive ways and it reflects favorably on the people that are honored today on this wall and on the wall behind us. Because as the, pro as the pro profession progresses, becomes more professional, uh, the people that have worked here, that retired here after many years of service, they gave their life. It is an ongoing memorial and show of respect to them that the department improves and becomes better in all facets. This is, this is a proud and forward-looking family. I thank you for the privilege and the honor to come here today and just offer some small words as a gesture in comparison to the sacrifice and hard work of all the police officers that came before the current officers and the current people men and women that patrol the streets of East Chicago every day and deal with every single situation that comes up. So God bless you all that have served or are serving, and East Chicago is a better place as a result of that service. Thank you very much for that.